Hi, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Wherever you find us, whether it's a video or podcast on your favorite platform, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. You can also find us on major social media platforms. If you go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, you can find links to the videos or MP3 files, which you can download and enjoy without commercial interruptions. If you're into classic horror, ghost, and adventure stories, I narrate Nightshade Diary, and you can find links at NightshadeDiary.com. If scary stories are your bag, and listening to encounters with cryptids, ghosts, dogmen, and other weird creatures sends a shiver up your spine, then go to SupernaturalStoryTime.com for links to our weekly podcasts. Noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird can be found at eerie.news or visit the Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Please subscribe to my newsletter on Substack. Just go to mppelliser.com for a link. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good, I hope. Everything is good here. And I want to follow up and say I got a lot of positive feedback from the Mardi Gras show. Okay, even though it was a little bit staggered, uh, which was back on the 13th of February. And as I explained in that, even though traditionally you think of February of uh, the 13th as Friday the 13th, much among Hispanics, it's Tuesday the 13th. But anyway, I did that whole show around besides the Mardi Gras thing about the superstition of the number 13. And a lot of people were surprised. Like there was one part where I say it, where Lloyd's of London, which is a very famous and well-known, well-established insurance company, would not insure a ship that either sets, you know, was leaving, you know, either on the 13th or much less the Friday the 13th. Okay. And so everybody thinks, oh, you know, it's people are superstitious and they believe all this weird stuff. Uh, 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 uh. And let me tell you some of the most superstitious people are stuff having to do with nautical stuff. You'd be surprised. I was like, they believe this? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that that uh, is attached to, even in modern times. How's this? Even in modern times. So anyway, besides that, everything is great. Um, I am going to, even though we're still a few months out, I am going to do the Halloween one. Um, and the reason why I say is, let's face it, the rate we're going... Time flies when you're having fun, and I'm having fun, so pretty soon we'll be there. And uh, I know people have asked me, because I haven't mentioned it that that often, how are my chickens doing? All my chickens are doing fine, and I have my guineas, which are now laying eggs for me, and yeah, they're all fine. I haven't I haven't had anybody, I haven't, as a matter of fact, well, no, I take that back. Uh, yesterday, I lost one of my very oldest hens. She was like, six or seven years old she was like a bantam naked neck cross and i was a little bit upset but then i thought you know what she lived a long life for a chicken like six or seven years and i bought her and she just died because she was chicken life she was an old hen she was an old hen so yeah that kind of stuff but otherwise everything is good still been cold up here in north florida everybody asks no snow no snow, but it dips down into like 40, 39 degrees at night. So as a matter of fact, when I finish the show, that's what I got to do. I got to run outside and I've got a big coop and I got to close it up and stuff like that and make sure everybody gets along good because these guineas and it's like, I'm telling you, chicken kingdom, that's savage. So yeah, I got I to gotta take care of them. But let's get on to the good part. The good part is who's the guest tonight here at Stories of the Supernatural. This is the first time. This gentleman has been here. His name is Maxim W. Furick. He has a very eclectic background, which includes aspects of psychology, addictions, and rock journalism. He has a master's degree in communications from Bloomberg, Bloomsburg University and a bachelor's degree in psychology from Aquinas College. He is an avid researcher of contemporary drug trends and psychosocial aspects of the drug culture. He has written numerous articles for both addictions and rock, rock publications. His books include The Jordan Brothers, Rock's Fortunate Sons, The Death Proclamation of Generation X, A Self-Fulfilling Prophecy of Goth, Grunge, and Heroin, which traces the origins of the current opiate epidemic, and Shepton, The Myth, Miracle, and Music. 
His column, Cultural Trends, appeared in Counselor, the magazine for addiction and behavioral health professionals. His most recent book releases, uh, Flying Saucer Esoteric, The Altered States of Ufology. This was released in September of 2023. And before that, Coleridge and Who Do Paranormal Tales from Inside the Pit. That was released in March of 2023. So help me welcome him. How are you doing today, Max? Hi, Marlene. Uh, <laughs> great to hear your voice. And thanks so much for the invite. Yeah, I'm, I'm I was looking contrary. forward to uh, yeah, I was looking forward to having a conversation with you. So, uh, yeah, I'm over here in Citrus County, Florida. Oh, okay. A little place called, little place called Hernando. So yes. I spend I spend summers in Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh-huh. and then I and and that's Bigfoot country. And yes. then I spend the winters down here in in the Sunshine State. So uh, oh yeah. So this is great. Thanks so much for having me. Let me tell you something. I know it gets cold, and I tell everybody, but. I just I don't think I would do well with snow if I had to shovel snow and I that's just I'm I'm a Floridian I'm a native Floridian and it's like I could take the cold and even then I'm like uh uh-huh. I tell everybody I'm a weather wimp but that snow thing I look at these people walking through these snow drifts and I'd be like oh oh <laughs> so yeah that that I spent quite a few winters uh, back home you know with that so uh, yeah, it's yeah, better yeah. down here. Yes. It's better down here. Sometimes it's cold in the morning, but it warms up fast. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm liking Florida. Yeah, of course. And people, how long have you been coming down here? For a while, or was it recent? This will, this will be our seventh, our seventh season. So, oh, uh, you've been here a long a time home. then. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We bought, bought a place in 2017, and we became uh, Florida residents last year. So okay. So we're, 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 we're street legal. We're legit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what some people have, believe it or not? Some people, especially from up north, sometimes have a problem with the summers here, because they're they're they can't handle the hot, humid. Even especially if you're like south of West Palm, yeah. Absolutely. You know, when uh, we were here in I think it was June, mm-hmm. and uh, we have a community pool where I live, and it was ninety four degrees in the water, ninety four degrees. Yay! So, <laughs> I know, but I, I you know we had fun. So I know, uh, I know, yeah, I know. Let me tell you something. I come, I can't complain, but you know what? When I'm steaming in the hot, and I, I mean, I grew up in South Florida. I grew up in Miami, so I know what hot and humid is. But I'm when it's the summer, I'm like complaining, bitching, and complaining, like, oh my god, it's so hot. What? what, what? I can't wait till it's winter, and now I'm doing the same thing. Oh my god, it's so cold. So yeah, you know, I, I'm that kind of person. But down bottom line, I like the heat better. But anyway, Max, I was fascinated obviously you've done a you've done a wide variety of coverage okay how did you what's this question did you decide to progress from the the journalism and having to do with rock groups or music into the paranormal and ufology or did you have an experience how did that happen yeah well i just i stumbled into it you know really um Back home in northeastern Pennsylvania, there was a song called Timothy, 1971. I know that Timothy song. Was, yeah, that was written by Rupert Holmes, the Pina Colada man. You know, really? Was, You're kidding. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. And Rupert was trying to get uh, this group called The Boys, B-U-O-Y-S, trying to get them some notoriety. Uh-huh. So he wrote a song, wrote a song about cannibalism in a mine. And yes. uh, I was working on a rock mythology, and I was trying to connect the song Timothy from 71 with the 1963 Shepton Mine disaster where, okay. and this is a true story, three guys were in tune for two weeks and only two came out and there were allegations of cannibalism. So let me ask you something, then that third... song was based on fact? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Even though Rupert dances around it and even though he says that it wasn't and even though he says that he didn't know about Shepton, but then during the 50-year anniversary of Shepton, he said, you know, just maybe... I had heard something and it crept into my subconscious. Okay, yeah, that all right. The, the sure. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I said. So, so anyway, as I'm researching the Shepton, what I call, call the Shepton mythology, mm-hmm. I found these really bizarre things, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, and afterlife experiences. This is the Shepton uh, mine disaster of 1963. The miners saw... The vision of Pope John the Twenty Third. They saw him in the mine. He stayed there with them. He gave them a sign of peace that they were going to be rescued. That's unusual. They That's were... very unusual. You know that, right? 
of all the people. Well, what's real unusual is that Pope John the Twenty Third died in June, oh. and that was before Shepton. Shepton was in August, so this was a purported uh, act of uh, of uh, life after death. Yes. And when Pope John the Twenty Third was canonized in 2014, Vatican academics said that yes, Shepton was one of his miracles. So this Shepton thing just got bigger and bigger. And I so I put out a book called. Uh, Shefton, the Myth, Miracle, and Music. That was the nineteen, the last day of 2015, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden that just blew up. And I get invited on all these podcasts and paranormal conferences, and I mean, it just opened the door. And again, it was a fluke. I, I never went. Let looking me ask for you: the in the Shefton incident, how many men were trapped in that mining? There were three three men trapped for two weeks, and only came, two came out. So, in so other words, the, minus, it, okay, that that see that. You know what? And I'm going to interject this real quick for anybody that's not familiar, that's a little bit older, not familiar with that song. When you listen to it, you got to listen to it a couple of times before you start realizing, wait a minute, are they talking about yeah. they yeah, ate them? Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a really nice tune. And then you start really listening to the lyrics and you're like, huh? But yeah. I know. And and that was the yuck factor. And that was sort of that, what, that controversy, that yuck factor promoted propelled the song to number 17 on billboard so oh. anyway uh, i'm you know researching shepton and i find all these weird paranormal things and that opened up the, the gates the doors to the paranormal universe and i've been accepted and just like i mean i just can't tell you how wonderful it is you know and i'm a rock journalist you know i okay. write about rock and roll and i write about drugs and i have a real passion for rock and roll as i have a passion for recreational dr- drugs now let me let me clarify this you know as an academic you know i mean i mm-hmm. like to talk about talk about bath salts and synthetic cannabinoids and uh ketamine you know the derivative of pcp phencyclidine yes. uh you know angel dust and uh you know all the other stuff and you know uh, so um you know i've uh i worked for a while for the pennsylvania department of health mm-hmm. doing anti-drug lectures okay and write writing articles writing anti drug articles so you know but it's the sex drugs and rock and roll i mean i love the rock and i love the drugs again as an academic as you know to study them not to you know not to do that no, uh, right 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 and, and let's face it that is part and parcel of the rock and roll lifestyle if you want to call it that i don't know but yeah you... yeah yeah and and and, and, the, and the thing about drugs you know I, I don't do drugs i mean i have in my younger days but i'll tell you what with some of the hallucinogen, hallucinogens that are floating around, you know, mm-hmm. that, that try to mimic uh, ecstasy, MDMA, a lot of these things, they, uh, they promote themselves as being a drug that's going to go and make music and sex and life better. But typically what happens is you get so overamped and, you know, that, it, that you become psychotic. So, you know, yeah. the stuff, I just warn people, just, you know, buyer beware. You know, you don't know where this stuff is. There's just no quality control where maybe they there were back in the day but there, there's not now so well, yeah you know, no you uh, you know the sources and let me ask you since you were involved in that field max did you ever come across anything what they call that 27 club which was all these musicians that died at that age yeah i've done extensive uh writing about the 27 club and as a matter of fact when i was writing for a uh, counselor uh the magazine for addiction and behavioral health professionals I coined the term celebrity blood voyeurism, society's fascination for people like Amy Winehouse and Mm -hmm. Janis Joplin and Kurt Cobain, all of them, by the way, being 27, Jim Morrison, uh, Jimi Hendrix. And uh, uh, I'm writing a book, uh, another project called uh, Celebrity Blood Voyeurism, and I have a chapter on the 27 Club, and it's extensive. I mean, you know, it's just too bad that these people died at that, at that, age. Robert Johnson, you know the, you know the, the Crossroads guy, the blues guitar player. Yes. You know he was 20, 27 when he was poisoned by his girlfriend's lover, his girlfriend's husband. But uh, just yeah, that twenty seven. Right, right. Because just... some of them did die from drugs. You know, I like it's like okay, but then other stuff happened to them. Like you said, like that they were like killed or just weird stuff would happen to them at that age. Yeah, yeah. There was one guy that uh, I think got electrocuted. There was a whole bunch of stuff, you know. Yeah. So um, just, it's just, you know, just pretty, pretty amazing. But, um, but then again, you know, there's people that have died at age 26 and 25 and 28 and 29. So, you know, it's just a number, but it's just amazing 
the, um, uh, the, uh, the amount of celebrity, you know, superstars. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and back in the, the 60s, you know, Joplin, Morrison, and Hendrix. I mean, all three, 27, and boom, boom, boom. You know, they went one, two, three, and Morrison, who is from Melbourne, Florida, yes. uh, Morrison said that he's number, he, he said uh, he's number three. So he was sort of Well, you know what? That. It's almost like that thing, you know, like that people, when they die at the, you know, like, um, how's this? Like before you get old, like at the height of your fame, like the price of fame kind of deal. It's like, this is like the, like a bargain kind of thing. You know, you, you become famous and at the height, you die youthful because let's face it, you're 27. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, okay, like Neil Young said, yeah, you uh, you flame out, right, and uh, yes. and you don't rust, you don't rust out. So somebody like James Dean, mm-hmm. that was only had three motion pictures, but yes. you know he was this good looking young kid. You know he mumbled his words, and he sort of like had offered us the template. You know some of the the, the guys of the fifties, you yes. know that you could mumble and just be this like sort of like. Um, uh, smoldering guy you know you you know in the background you know you you know you weren't front and center but you're, you're sort of in the back but when he died the, everybody remembered his youth because he was young right when he, there's when he there's died no pictures of him like all these other actors or celebrities that grow old eventually you know they're forever young because that's all there is because when they died and that's they, what that's what it was yeah and when you look at elvis who was you know really good looking and yeah and 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 and, and uh, sexual sensual mm-hmm. you know as as a young man and then you know he became bloated and obese oh and, god uh, yes you know, just, and, and and self-destructive it was just sad how elvis went out you know i mean just like eating like a pig and uh, you know and it's too bad but um, right right but and then anyway, you think I mean, you hear about and i don't know how much that you know that he was fixated when that his mom had died when she was relatively young in the sense of the 40s you know and you know you wonder how much of this is besides actual lifestyle choices, is like a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of deal. So, and even now, yeah. look at his daughter. She passed away also young, which is a shame, but... Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. Same with Whitney Houston and her daughter. Yeah, know, yes, my God, someone, that's someone, right. Someone yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, uh, there was a guy named Nick, Nicholas Adamshock. Nick Adams was his name, and he was a pretty big thing in the 60s. He had a program called The Rebel, and he was this Confederate soldier that walked around and did have these adventures. He was trying to avenge his father's death, but he kept a journal. Okay. And Nick Adams, okay. Nick Adams was one of the guys that was in uh, uh, Rebel Without a Cause, yes. which they called a cursed film because people like Nick Adams, James Dean, Sal Mineo, uh, Natalie Wood, they all died mysterious deaths. They were all in that motion picture. But anyway, Nick Adams is buried in Berwick, Pennsylvania. That's my hometown. Okay. And I have pictures. I was I was neighbors with his mother, Catherine Adamshock, and I have pictures of Nick Adams and his mother there in Graceland with Elvis and Elvis's mom. Wow. And uh, Nick was hanging out there, and I got these black and white shots. I mean, they're like vintage. I don't. I, I don't bet. know if they've ever been published anyplace, but. Um, uh, but Nick Adams uh, and, and James Dean, when James Dean died in that car crash, mm-hmm. I think the last mo- motion picture that he had was Giant. And yes. he mumbled, mumbled some of his, his lines. So they had Nick Adams redo those lines because Nick Adams was really good at imitating voices. So mm-hmm. Nick Adams is, was in the movie Giant. And, uh, you know, just an interesting thing. But Nick Adams and... Uh, James Dean, they lived together for a while. Uh, they were pals. When Elvis came to L.A., Elvis was a shy kid. He was just a shy little kid from Mississippi. And they Hard to took tell, him huh? around. And, and Yeah, really, really. And took him around and introduced him to people and introduced him to Natalie Wood and all this other stuff. So Let me ask you, know, didn't um, Nick pretty, Adams, maybe I'm misremembering, didn't he die under weird circumstances, like something? Yeah, he did. He died, he died in... Uh, uh, Los Angeles, he died of peraldehyde poisoning. Okay. And I have, uh, I have three chapters on Nick Adams in my book, Coal Region Hoodoo, Paranormal right. Tales from Inside the Pit. And anyway, Nick Adams died of peraldehyde poisoning. His daughter, Allison, thinks that he was killed, that he was killed by his attorney. Uh, you know, this hasn't been proved, but um, right. he died uh, of peraldehyde poisoning. And it looked like he was locked inside the house. It didn't look like anybody actually burst into the house, you know, busted into the house. So mm-hmm. it was it was a mysterious, a mysterious uh, 
you know, death, but they, but it, it was called um, uh, accidental peraldehyde intoxication. You know, I think under suspicious cause. Right, one of those that. things where they didn't say it was suicide, but they didn't say it was a crime, and I'm sure the police didn't do anything with it, and that was that. You know. Yeah, I don't think it was. I don't think it was a suicide. I think that. Uh, oh no, but you I, know the the. the, yeah, the yeah. But yeah, again, he was a young guy, you know, since they're in that same age group as, uh, well, obviously the thing that happened with uh, James Dean, you know, the, it was a car wreck. So it's like, okay, but uh, it's it's incredible. Again, it's almost like, you know, if you want to get a little bit into the spooky stuff, it's like that bargain that you make, you know, you're going to you're gonna be, yeah. become very famous. And unfortunately, even at the height of your fame, you have so much promise of what's yet to happen for you, but that's it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'll tell you what. Um, uh, Stephen Tyler of Aerosmith said that fame is like like a, a, a like a hundred chickens just picking at you, just pecking at you. And you know, I mean, it's one thing, you know, to do something to hit it out of the park, but then try to do that again. I mean, most people don't, whether they're rock singers or authors or actors or what. You know, it's really tough to follow up on uh, you know, a, a, a standard. You know. A, a, uh, a barometer, you know, something, some accomplishments, some oh, wonderful yeah. accomplishments. It's almost like you become your, to... your own worst enemy. Like, uh, what's exactly, that? Exactly, yeah. Um, and, to kill a mockingbird. You know, Everybody was waiting for the next. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <that's> <laughs> it, it never yeah. happened. It never ha And I read the book, and it, yeah, it, was, it was okay, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't like. Uh, the other, the, her first book just resonated. I mean, like she captured something, you know. So. Right. And even though I've heard, I, and I, again, I don't know, that the one that really did pen To Kill a Mockingbird was Truman Capote. But again, who cares? Because everybody was expecting, okay, well, what are you going to do now? You know, after you wrote this yeah. book that was made into a movie that blah, 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 blah. And then it just kind of like, yeah stopped right yeah. there i you know i've been fortunate as an author because my my books have have been doing really well and uh you know so i my my philosophy i guess is just to have as many balls in the air as you can because the more things you have going for you the more you give the universe a chance to go and recognize them and sure. uh embrace them and run with them and make things happen so it's almost like it's uh some kind of synergy, some kind of... Some sure, I think a lot of people here. talk themselves out of doing things because they, they, they go down that road of, oh, nothing's going to happen, nobody's going to notice. Let's say, some, let, let's talk on the creative side, whatever. And they just never yeah. get to the point of, let me try it. Like you said, let me see how many things I can do. But yeah. absolutely, well, if you don't do anything, are, nothing's going to happen, so... Yeah, yeah, people are held back by fear, you know, fear of failure and, and all this and uh I, you know, just love doing what I'm doing. I mean, I love doing the book signings. I like mm -hmm. having the book launches. And, you know, I mean, I have a little small following that people c come around. And it's, it's just nice. It's not, you know, Absolutely. It's not, uh, you know, it's not, you know, blown up my ego or anything like that. But it's just a nice of thing course. when people come up and say, you know, like, for example, with Shepton, uh, this one woman came up to me at a uh, program and said, you know, I read your book three times, three times. And I said, why? And she goes, I just liked it so much, you know, and, you know, that's just pretty amazing. Oh, but yes. That, that's a good feeling. That endorsement is worth, you know, like $100,000. I mean, it's priceless. So, you know, so yes. I, I, I've been, um, you know, so anyway, we're, you know, I've been. Let me ask you something of, real quick, uh, something, Max, since you, 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 you've been in both areas. Have you found like, especially when you were doing the rock and roll and, you know, some of the drug stuff, do you think that sometimes the drug use and the lifestyle, whatever, that sometimes it opens a doorway sometimes to darker things to happen or to come into the what's the lifestyle, whether it attracts certain people into the circle. Or just In other words, it kind of like, um, it just opens a doorway because of the activity that's going on. Do you think that's possible? Yeah, I think you're right. I think Pope, Pope Francis talked about evil, uh, evil being something that keeps you away from God. Keeps yes. you fur uh, further away from God, and that could be sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I mean, that could be a whole lot of things. That could be, uh, you know, the the wrong influences. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, uh, you know, I like to talk the God talk, and uh, you know, and uh, and you know, and I think, well, I you know, I don't want to get into this thing, but I mean, it's more than just Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. You know, there's a lot well, of, you know, I, I believe in higher powers, and you know, we get to pick and choose who are higher power is and um you know and and i think 
people, especially Christians, need to be respectful of that because it's not just one religion. You know. Oh got, no, no, no. You know, and by this, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, and like I said, this is this has really nothing to do with religion or even denomination. I'm talking about where, you know, when people, let's say they're they're that's their lifestyle. Let's say they're doing crazy stuff with crazy people. It's kind of risky. But then sometimes I think some the evil, if you want, let's call it that, the evil with a capital E, it's almost the thing that whispers in your ear that pushes you to do that one thing that takes you in a direction, either by one act or just leads you down the road. You know, yeah. it's, I'm not talking exorcist stuff, you know, like, oh, stuff flying around. I'm talking about choices that are made that mm-hmm. end up being well, really, really bad. Yeah, specifically, you know, I warn people about fortune tellers, seances, tarot cards, Ouija boards, and all that. I think those could be portals to some place that's dark and, and foreboding. So, you know, I, I, th- th- those things scare me, so I stay away from that. But, but it could be, you know, you want to associate yourself with people that are positive, people that share your values, people that have your back, people that love your light, yes. all of that positivity. I mean, that's what's going to get you through, you know, the darkness. And, um, you know, um, you know, I, I get up in the morning, I do my stretches and I meditate and that's mm-hmm. how I start my day. And with the meditation, you know, what, throughout the day, when the demons start to come, you know, again, all of your listeners are homo sapiens, you know, we're all human beings. We all suffer from the same darkness, you know, the same yes. mental illness, the same neuroses. And, uh, for me, uh, meditation is just a wonderful thing because throughout the day, if the demons start coming after me, I just get into that little pocket where I meditate, uh, where I feel safe and, uh, and loved, and I get back there. And that's the, that's the best we have as human beings. I mean, that's the best that we can do to just go and control our thoughts and our mind uh, because right. bad things happen and sure. bad things will happen. And uh, things that, I mean, things will happen to us that we don't deserve, you know, bad things. But oh, right, exactly. That's, that, and that's the most yeah. difficult one to comprehend. I know, I know, yeah. yeah. Why do bad things happen to good people? Mm-hmm. You know? so, well, yes. bad things happen to bad people, too. So, you well, know, but... you know what, how's this? I think that sometimes when people, let's say if you're involved in a risky lifestyle and something bad happens, it's like, okay, you know, you had some part in that. But I think when people, like you said, when you're like, I'm living a good life or I'm being a moral person or I, I'm a nice person or whatever, and then bad things happen. People are like, this is not supposed to happen to me because I'm a nice person or I do the right thing or, or hey, I don't go out to the bad part of town in the middle of the night. So maybe why did I get mugged or whatever? And I think that's yeah, where yeah, sometimes yeah, but, people have yeah. a problem with that deduction. Yeah. I, I think during my younger days, I mean, like, I think I was on a path of self-destruction. I mean, like, I, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to taste it all. I wanted to get all those yayas and experience <laughs> everything. And, you know, and, and, uh, uh, you know, it was like a, a life of, uh, of excess, of a hedonist. Okay. And, um, you know, and, and, and again, that's, my story isn't, isn't unique. You know, I mean, a lot of my, my buddies, a lot of my friends, you know, we, we talk about the same thing. I mean, it's good that we stopped. It's good that we pulled out sure, of that. It's right. good that we met somebody to give us stability, all that. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, but, but again, some of that comes with maturity and age and, uh, you know, it, it, not everybody gets the message. I mean, there's some people uh, that crash and burn and, you know, so. Well, some, like I the, think like, at like, some like point that the, the, the self-preservation part kicks in. Where your subconscious mind tells you, you keep on doing this, you're going to end up pushing up daisies, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So at some point, either, like you said, maturity or, you know, the, the reality of it starts, you know, your subconscious starts tapping you on the shoulder. Yeah. And it could be. Yeah. It could also be uh, deemed a miracle. You know, I've talked sure. to so many people. You know, I used to work, work in, uh, I was in addictions counselor mm-hmm. and i used to talk to these people in recovery like how did you get into recovery you know heroin addicts people that were i mean really at the, at the bottom right. um how did you get into recovery and so many people have told me that they don't know he goes i don't know how it happened but it was a miracle it was a miracle that i stopped or somebody who had a problem and was invited to go to an aa meeting and said okay what the heck i'll go and right. that became the the, the first day of the rest of their lives where they got into recovery. But, you know, uh, you know, for a lot of us, 
that are doing these these maladaptive things. You know, like when we have issues, you could do adaptive things that are positive and they have a good result, or you could do maladaptive things like drugs, alcohol, sex, mm-hmm. shopping, eating, whatever you know that right. that are harmful, that are harmful. And uh, so you know, so you have you have those choices. So you know, I think a lot of people they just the easy way out is just to do the drugs and you know cover over the misery. I mean, as a, you do know, you that, think that a lot of this behavior, though, in some cases, is traced back to childhood trauma, whether it was emotional or physical, and they just they how so this they never went to therapy for it or it was never addressed. Yeah, and that's how they yeah, cope that's, with that's, it. That, that's a good point because you know when with trauma, you know you it it, it doesn't go away. It's like mm-hmm. it's in your fiber, you know, and you could either put it in a lockbox and put it over on the side. And repress it, but it usually comes out some way. Yes. And uh, the, the you know one of the best things is is talk therapy, where you talk to a counselor or a priest or a rabbi, and mm-hmm. you make sense of it, and you give it parameters. So this trauma that you're dealing with, this bad thing that happened to you as as a child, you know, it's it happened. It's part of your 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 resume, but you're safe now, and you didn't cause that, and you could just put it over there on the side where it has a beginning and end and it's contained and it doesn't have to go and eat you away because you're not trying to repress, you're not using all these energies to repress it and hide it and say it didn't really happen. Well, it did happen and that's unfortunate. But, you know, I mean, I know, I know women who had, who had been sexually abused and 40 years later, they're still dealing with that trauma. Right, like, like they, they're, 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 they live under the shadow of that event, even if now they're adults yeah. and maybe it was happened, like you said, 40 years before. And yeah, it still cast yeah. a shadow over their lives. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And and for those of us that, who don't have to deal with that, I mean, thank God. I mean, what a blessing. I mean, imagine what it would be like to go through life, you know, having been, say, say, molested by a loved one, by a parent. You right. know, those those people that are there to love and protect oh, you. Oh, what? That's a very deep in, betrayal. In, yeah. Instead, they abuse you. They, yeah. they, mm-hmm. they, yeah. Oh, no, uh, no, yeah, absolutely. That, yeah, that... I, tru- I truly, I truly, I want to say that that's like a double betrayal besides the whatever happened, whether it was physical, sexual abuse, molestation, plus at the hands of a caregiver. That's like a double betrayal because like you said, this is the person that's supposed to be protecting you. And instead, right. you know, they're the perpetrator. So yeah, I, 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 you know, I think that sometimes that behavior where you see these people uh, with the drug problems and the addiction, and it's like they're trying to, I guess deal cope with something that happened yeah. and they just yeah 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 they're trying you know, usually they're trying to either run away from something or run towards something you know run away from the pain or mm-hmm. run towards a better life you know but the drug the, the drugs don't help I mean all they do oh, is they just God. like you know they, they just they just give you a little bit of uh, downtime a little they put you in a twilight zone for a while and then you know you wake up and the, and, uh, the problem is exacerbated it's still there and it's maybe yeah. even bigger so yeah what is that uh, yeah, saying yeah, everywhere yeah, you go there you are it's like yeah you like you exactly, said <laughs> very good yeah exactly yeah <laughs> let me ask you when and this is i know it's a little bit on the unusual side but since you you know you worked with addicts or people in recovery do you think yeah. that some people that you know kept trying to go be sober in other words they and they couldn't they just couldn't do you think there was such a thing as what they call spirit attachment where any of them were being influenced by negative spiritual attachments that that's why they in other words logically they wanted to not do the drugs whatever it was whether it was alcohol or whatever and they, or they understood i'm gonna die or maybe it's ruined my life whatever but they just couldn't stay without doing what they were doing the behavior do you think that there was some type of spiritual turbulence or anything that was interfering yeah, you you could call it that, and 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 you're probably right. But also, the more you do the drug, the more you have these toxins in your system. Mm-hmm. The more it's going to go and impact on your cognition. Uh, you, you know, um, you know, uh, it's it's going to be more emotive than cognitive. Uh, you're going to make wrong decisions, and it, there's this cycle. You know, you're stressed out, and so the only thing you know is doing a drug to get relief, or you know, your drug, whatever that is. You know, sex. Right food, whatever, Mm -hmm. you go to that thing that relieves it. And what needs to happen is there has to be something else. 
I'm like, okay. you know, you get stressed out, so you need to have a time out where you could go and call somebody, prayer, pray, go to a meeting, whatever, do anything it takes to not do that drug, not do that line, not shoot up again. So that's what is, you know, and because drug addicts act like animals. And by that, what I mean is, and I'm not being disrespectful, but it's stimulus response. They, mm-hmm. they get, you know, they, they get stressed out. So that's the stimulus. And then they just go and get high. Um, humans do stimulus cognition response. So okay. something happens and then hopefully we think about it and say, Hey, what's, what should I do? Should I do something adaptive or maladaptive? Now, right. What should I, what's the best thing I can do, mm-hmm. you know, in this situation? And, uh, you know, not doing drugs is a real good, it would be a real good choice, but. Right, know. right. <clears throat> well, well th- th- this is, I, and you know, and, and, and I'm sure you're familiar, you know, basically when you've trained, you know, we're talking here, not, not like, a, you know, you, the reward centers in your brain are primed to like drive that behavior where you do the drug or whatever, the, the behavior, if it's like shoplifting or shopping or whatever, you know, it comes in many forms. Um and I think that's the difficult part, especially when you've been, this is what you've been doing for years and years to all of a sudden, like, well, logic well, it's, yourself it's, out of that. Yeah, it's the synapses. So when you're, when you're into the drugs, you know, like the, you go from the stress to the drug and you have these synapses, these pathways mm-hmm. in your brain. I mean, it's just like, uh, you know, walking through a, a lawn. And just getting rid of the grass, and there's just a pathway there. Well, what you need to do, and the brain is resilient. The brain grows new branches and synapses. And what you need to do is you need to create new pathways. So if you're addicted, there are ways to do this. And what they use is they use cognitive behavioral therapy, and they do two things. I mean, it's like the treatment du jour. You Tell, you know, you instruct the, the individual to stop doing the drug, mm-hmm. show them ways to do that. And then also cognitively, you let them know that by doing the drug, it's not going to be the panacea that they think it is. You know, by doing the drug, it's not a good thing. It's just going to complicate their lives and, and, and compound their, their issues. So, you know, you work on both themes at the same time, you know, the cognitive behavioral and, um, you know, uh, you know, I worked with clients that were duly diagnosed. They were, uh, you know, or individuals with co-occurring disorders. So they might have schizophrenia and addiction. Mm-hmm. And the deal was, the plan is to deal with both things at the same time. And the other thing is view uh, the substance, you know, right. say alcohol, mm-hmm. and the mental illness, view both of those as primary and chronic. And don't be saying that drugs cause uh, you know, the, the mental illness or the mental illness caused the drugs. I mean, they may uh, dance around together. They may exacerbate each other, but they're both primary issues. And, you know, I think uh, I know uh, so many people that would rather say, well, I'm addicted than I'm mentally ill because there's sure. less of this, less of an uh, stigma to be to be a, a drug addict than to be mentally ill. So but Right. Um, and, and and if you've been and, self-medicating with these drugs, whatever they were, I imagine it's easier to do that than to take the meds. Let's say in the case of a schizophrenic, like the prescription, the ones that you are supposed to take, you know, to make you yeah. address what's really wrong, let's say, with, you know, the, your brain in this case or whatever, versus like mm-hmm. if you've been medicating with, you know, whatever it is that you've come across, that's that's difficult. Mm-hmm. As far yeah. as and one 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 other thing too, just for the good of the order, you know, I'm a baby boomer. We're the people yeah, born so between I. 19, <laughs> okay, 19, 1946 to 1964. Yeah, our people, we were the ones who were abused, abused LSD and mescaline yes, and psilocybin yes. and all that stuff, and that's why they got scheduled. You know, it's unfortunate because those drugs could have been, we could have experimented with those, and and just like for example, ketamine is the go-to drug for depression. Ketamine works. Instant, almost instantaneously, as opposed to say Prozac and those SSRIs that take like one, two, three weeks to mm-hmm. kick in. Yeah. So, uh, so ketamine, you know, that had been abused by the by the kids, you know, in, in that K hole, you know, all the raves and the clubs, you know, um, a lot of these drugs could have been used uh, for for experiments, you know, for the for the sure. good of the order. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, yeah, and it, yeah, yeah, yeah. For people just, who really needed it, not like. Because I want to party, Elsa. Yeah, 
And and I'm and I'm I'm raising my hand because I was one of those too. I mean, my drugs of choice were hallucinogens, and uh, you know, and I kind of liked them. And uh, but but uh, at least I never did the uh, you know the heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, all that. Uh, but I'm just saying again, I'm, I'm not. This isn't a pro drug thing. I'm just saying that oh, no. that was my experience. My experience, you know, it was a good one. I don't think there was any harmful effects. I think you know and. and <laughs> You know, and you know, so uh, so you know, but but you know, I'm not you know, I'm not being a hypocrite with people. You know, when sure. I when I talk when I do my anti-drug rant because right. uh, you know, you've been um, there, you've, uh, you know, you've then, seen the both sides yeah, of the coin. Yeah, 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 yeah no, yeah, it, it's it's you know what people like I said, unless you've been, a, I mean, I was very young, so but as I was, you know, you you hear about like you said in the '60s. You know, and all this and into the 70s was when you, I even heard, you know, about people that did LSD and then later on, even if they weren't doing it, they would have a, a trip. They would be tripping out. And basically that it damaged your brain. I was like, man, you got to be crazy to be doing this stuff, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then you wonder how did this ever, you know, take off. But, and you know, here we are now, we're being overrun like, uh, you know, with a fentanyl and then with the other different types of drugs. Oh. and. Things like that. I mean, it's horrible. It's, it's horrible. And the fentanyl has been around for a long time. Yes. And, you know, China's sending it over here and it goes mm -hmm. to Mexico. And it's just, it, it's really, really difficult to stop that. And, I mean, don't blame any one political party for it because no, it's been no, around no, for no. a long, Drugs have been long, coming over in some, some form yeah, or other a for long, a while. A long time. A long time. And you Yeah. Know, no, I, I, I want to say that besides the actual, it's just that that people don't well no people do realize what am i saying that some of these things that are cooked they will kill you on the just from the get-go because of the way they were put together if you're yeah. just lucky enough that you get the wrong batch you, you it'll kill you you know yeah. the 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 reason for some of these toxic mixes out there some of these heroin addicts you know they don't get high anymore so they go through withdrawal so they use the drug more as a medication just to help them go through that you know really bad withdrawal where all the euphoric feeling is, is reversed right um, and, and they don't get high anymore so here's this new batch of dope that's on the streets and a lot of these old timers they want it and they're not thinking they're going to die they're thinking they're going to get high yes. and they haven't gotten high in a long long time so they're chasing that chasing that high you know that that mm -hmm. bell ringer they want that they want to experience that again and uh and yes. uh, some of them do, some of them do but some of them uh shoot up and overdose and die but but it it's it drives sales because people know that there's some good stuff out there you know that the drug community talks to each other and they know there's some good stuff out there and so they and go it's looking inexpensive for it. it's inexpensive exactly yeah, there's take... a it, whereas before certain drugs were you know like uh, let's say in the 80s you know cocaine you know it Mm -hmm. It wasn't a cheap drug if you were, you know, if you were hooked on it, whereas all of these, you know, these last few years, it's very inexpensive to, from the crack yeah. to all yeah. this other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think they say uh, a six pack of beer is, is more expensive than like a, a couple of sure. stamps of heroin. Yeah. So. I think probably regular cigarettes are too, <laughs> with all the tariffs yeah. and stuff that they got on them. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, 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 Amazing. it's, it's a deep, dark hole. But I'm going to get back to something that I think was from that book that you were talking about, the um, the Hoodoo book, okay? Oh, Cole Reese, yeah, Cole Reese yes. and Hoodoo, yeah. That, that came out last year. Yes. And, uh, that, yeah, Cole Reese and Hoodoo is published by Beyond the Fray. They're a paranormal house from San Diego. And, uh, yeah, they did a really good job with it. I, I love that book. It's called Cole Reese and Hoodoo, Paranormal Tales from Inside the Pit. But let me ask you, because you where you're like what you said was your hometown, is that considered like coal like an Appalachian coal mining area or or what? Well, not Appalachian. I mean, you know, when you think of Appalachian, you think about these hillbillies and you know a lot of poverty and that. No, we my area, northeastern Pennsylvania, by Scranton, Wilkesbury, it mm -hmm. was uh, there was a lot of coal mining there, and okay. there was the anthracite coal. So there were you know the, uh, anthracite fueled the industrial revolution i mean they had mines all over the place but the the sad thing is that uh the pennsylvania miners were like indentured servants i mean right. they worked hard they got black lung and they just had a horrible life and uh, and we had this thing called breaker boys 
they were little boys that they sent down into the mines to either take care of the, the mules or to uh, pick slag out of the, you know, the uh, breakers and all that. And uh, there's one case that one kid was five years old, oh and God. his father died, and, and he was the main breadwinner. So in order for them to keep their company, company home, the kid had it was sent down into the mines, and he was walking the mule there, but five freaking years old. My so God, that's incredible. That was, that was the thing. These mining companies did everything. They gave you housing, so as long as you work there, though, that's the kind of deal, right? Yeah, and then you never, you never, never paid the vig. You never got out of it. You know, sure. I mean, you always owed the man because what you bought at the company store. Right. That's what I was gonna say. The... Didn't they also like you shop? You had to shop at the company store, kind of deal. Like you couldn't get away from it, no matter what. <laughs> I know. It's like uh, uh, Hotel California. You know, you could never leave. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you know, there's a dispute going on right now with the lyrics of Cal Hotel California, but that's I another know. show. <laughs> I know. I just saw that. Yeah, they're they uh, they're ripping off Don Henley and everybody. Yeah. Yeah. There's something about that. It was written on a napkin or paper or something, and it's like, huh? I was like, man, that's yeah. that's an old song. It's like, yep, it's going to court now. Yeah. So let's see what happens with yeah, that. Yeah, I just read that the other day. Yeah. 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 That was one of the. I think the third uh, highest selling album yeah. album of all time. I think. I think everybody anyway. you you hear the, the 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 intro to Hotel California. Everybody knows what it is. <laughs> You know, so, so. I, I was listening to, years ago. I was listening to a CD, and it was um, a live uh, concert, and they were playing that, and they started off with that. And man, I wanted to cry. I mean, those opening guitar yeah. chords were just so man. They tug at your heart. You know, they're really, oh, really yeah. pretty good. So yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's it's that, that when I read that, I was like, after so many years, I would have thought something like this would have come up long time ago. But then you never know. So yeah, yeah. let me ask you with the um, because one time I was up in that area, God, in that area of Pennsylvania. And I remember, I can't remember, it was a little town, but I meant it, it had to be in that area of Pennsylvania where you could see like it was a lot of like mining uh, towns, yeah. if you want to call them that. And you look yeah, at yeah. them and uh, it almost like this whole town, everything existed around the mining. This was the mainstay of the economy of these towns. And in a way, I mean, I'm beyond the, the what you were talking about, the mining thing. So mm -hmm. when you when you talk about the, the hoodoo, was this like, was this belief systems that the people that moved into the area came, brought with them? Or was this something that developed because of the culture of working in the mines? Well, hoodoo could be either a blessing or a curse. Okay. You know, we talk about, we talk about voodoo. You know, mm -hmm. down in, in New Orleans and Louisiana, but right. you know, I talk about the hoodoo. Hoodoo, hoodoo could be a, it is an offshoot of that. It could be a religion or not, but it could be either a blessing or a curse. And for a lot of the miners, I mean, like it was a curse to live there and work there. The communities were called patch towns, and okay. even today, if you go go to northeastern Pennsylvania and drive around, and it's really pretty cool because it's like driving back into the past to see some yes. of these towns that are still like they were, you know? And we also have a place in uh, where I live in Columbia County called Centralia. Mm -hmm. And around 1962, they set a fire, you know, in this coal mine, they're just burning garbage, and it caught fire. And to this day, to oh this my day, God, yes. it's Centralia, and they did uh, Silent Hill. Yes, based on yes. Centralia. Yeah, based on Centralia. So it's real close to where I live, but you should see this thing. So, what happened? Basically, was, didn't um, ha everybody have to move out of there? Is that didn't it kind of empty the exactly, town? Exactly. Yeah. There's there's maybe maybe right now five families that live there, and once they die off, that's going to be it. Uh, they won't be allowed to be there. But well, I used to drive through there, uh -huh. and they would have steam coming up from the 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 road would buckle, and they wow. had a thing called gra gra graffiti highway, and all these kids would go and spray paint like penises and all kinds of crazy <laughs> stuff, peace signs and all this thing. It was like maybe, I don't know, maybe like a half mile or a mile long. It's called Graffiti Highway. It was like the third biggest tur tourist att attraction in Pennsylvania. I mean, all these college kids would make a mecca to go there, the Graffiti Highway. And then, and this is in my book. I have a chapter in Coal Region Hoodoo about Centralia, but they uh, bulldozed that. They covered it up. But what happened was there was a Catholic priest who was who was speaking out against the Molly Maguires, and they okay. were rabble rousers, and they beat beat him up, and so he put a curse 
on the town of Centro. He said at the end, really, the only thing left, yeah, the only thing left standing will be Saint Ignatius Church, and now, and even that's gone. But, that, but he put a curse on the town, and uh, like I said, it's they call it the Devil's Fire. It started around 1962, and it's still burning. It's still, you know. I mean, did, let me ask you: Did they tons. did they do anything for these families? Because I can imagine your real estate. If you live there, that's it. Who's going to want to buy your house? With these... Yeah, they did two things. One, they did eminent domain. They mm-hmm. just took over a lot of these properties, and they and they bought people out. Now you okay. got to go and sign on the line, but they would buy you out, and then they relocated a lot of these people to other communities that they that they created. So they were close to Centralia, but out of the way. But, you know, Centralia is a pretty interesting thing. They have a Ukrainian uh, church. They're a Russian uh, Orthodox church that's mm-hmm. there. And they still have mass. And uh, But uh, pretty pretty amazing. But, um, you know, I used to go there, uh, you know, frequently and just go and take pictures and just you know, hang out. But it was kind of a neat thing. So no, that's – that's, that's that, I remember reading about that, and I was like, oh, my God. Can you imagine? It's like, okay, you cannot live there. And, and, and I imagine, you know, if you, this is your home and this is where you grew up and this is your, I'd be like upset. But eventually you've got no choice but to like leave. You can't stay there. And I had see, I yeah. had read somewhere something about the Silent Hill being like kind of like modeled on that. And that's a pretty disturbing oh. movie. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. very, very the like. Other thing about the thing too about Pennsylvania coal miners, for as bad as they had it, they had it worse than in uh, West Virginia. I mean, for, you know, they had to go and put more coal into their buggies and everything else, and that's why Mother Jones went down there to organize. I mean, she was like a feisty little babe, mm-hmm. you know, that went there and she was helping to organize these coal miners. And right. uh, so it was it was a hard life. But my book, Shepton: The Myth, Miracle, and uh, Music talks about that coal mining and the Shepton disaster and the fact that, and this is, you know, very few people know this, but the Chilean copper mine disaster of 2010, you know, they, they had a movie called The 33. Yes. Those 33 guys were rescued by Shepton Technologies, technology really? that they developed in 1963, yeah. And the other thing, too, you know, talk about cannibalism in Shepton, mm-hmm. in Chile, in Chile, these, they wrote, there was a movie, the 33, and then there were several books written about that. But they had rations for those 33 guys. So every day they would get a little thimble of milk, a little bit of tuna fish, and a couple of crackers. And that was what they would have for all day. And they had that water too. But, uh, so they knew that at a certain point the food rations were going to give out. Okay. And, again, they documented this. They said if that happens, we might have to go and cannibalize somebody. And this is like the, um, I guess, the black humor, the gallows humor. But all of those guys were Chilean, except for the one dude. He was from Ecuador. Oh, boy. And so the, the <laughs> thought, thought was, yeah, the guy from Ecuador is going to get it. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're outnumbered. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. The, the, you know, let me ask you, the original Shepton incident, what happened? Did there, was there an explosion? How was it that they ended up trapped? Yeah, it was called um, pillar. They were pillar robbers, and what they would do is they would go. These, this was an independent mine. Okay. And after the mining companies would get out of there, you know, when they thought there wasn't any profit left after mm-hmm. the mine was tapped out, pretty much, they would leave. And then I guess these independent miners would lease them. I don't know how that, how they worked it. I think they leased them, or else they just went down there and took it. I'm pretty sure they, there was something legitimate about it. But anyway, they would go in the back, and they had these pillars of rich coal holding up the, the mine. So they would start in the back mm-hmm. and maybe use timbers and everything, but they would take out these rich you know, the, 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 uh, pillars okay. and, then, and then do the next one and the next one. Well, what happened in Shepton was they were pillar robbing, and it was on a Tuesday, uh, they sent up. They they sent down the buggy. They filled it up. They sent it to the top, and this guy, this guy George Walker, he was the the foreman up there. So he dumped it, and sent it back down. And, and on the way back down, that's when everything just exploded. You know, just like it collapsed, and it was like a you know like Hiroshima. Like all these tons of rock and coal went down, and then they had the rushes, and it kept on. Every now and then, it would have it would be like another quake, and so the the uh, configuration of the mine kept on changing. But wow. the thing about Shepton, the thing about Shepton, 
it, it was an international story for two weeks. There were reporters there from, from Germany, the UK, from Japan, watching this thing. They had military people watching, you know, to see uh, people uh, to see how they could uh, survive under there. I mean, just like there was thousands of people, National Guard, uh, military, Salvation Army, the paparazzi, mm-hmm. the, the, the rubberneckers, the spectators. I mean, sure. it was a circus. It was a circus. And the Shepton Mine disaster of August of 1963 was one of the top stories of, of Associated Press until it was surpassed in November by the assassination of yes. President John Kennedy. Wow. 63. So that was a uh, pretty, pretty, pretty bizarre thing. Um, what happened, too, after they finally extricated the two miners and then never found the third one, but they went to the Hazleton General Hospital, and one by one they took the younger guy, this throne, and they flew him over in a chopper, and then they sent over Davy Fallon. He was 58. So it was like a symbiotic relationship, you know, the older guy, the younger guy. Mm-hmm. And the older guy pretty much helped the younger guy keep his act together. But anyway, they go over to the, uh, to the hospital. Now, the uh, Fallon, the uh, older gentleman, was a devout Catholic. Throne was just a drunkard, womanizer, just, you know, didn't have any religion at all. He's probably atheist. Okay. But they went there to the hospital, and there's a picture of Pope John the Twenty Third. Now, Throne probably wasn't he wasn't steeped in, in Roman Catholicism, didn't know that. But he goes to Davy, Davy, look, that's the guy, that's the stranger, that's who we saw wow. down there. I know that was just like amazing. Yes, and and there was a bit of a religious convergence because Throne. Uh, helped uh, form a non-denominational church there really? in Hazleton, and he, yeah, he stopped his drinking, and he, yeah, he 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 mended his ways. So that's pretty. Oh my amazing. God, that's a great story right yeah. there. Yeah, and one other thing too, there was a guy named Ed Conrad. He was a Gonzo journalist, like Hunter S. Thompson, and some of these guys. Ed Conrad took those miners down to uh, Bridgewater, Virginia, to meet Elizabeth Kubler Ross. And she wrote that book on death and dying. You know how yes. we, we, you know, we have anger and we right, negotiate. Right, right. The, the and steps and of uh, of grieving and all that stuff. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and she said that what happened there was a was an example of life after death, meaning the Pope John the twenty third. And they also took him to meet Dr. Bruce Grayson. And Bruce Grayson, I don't know if you've interviewed him, but he's like a scholar on near death experiences. And he was saying that what happened there at Shepton was profound. So how long were they down there, whole, Max? How how long were they, they, they were down? They were down. They were down there for two weeks, and they finally were able to go and uh, find them, do a borehole. Howard Hughes, the billionaire, mm-hmm. send up some uh, some uh, tungsten carbide bits, some drill bits okay. from Houston that that they used to bring them out. And uh, but they were down there 330 feet. And wow. uh, it was pre- precarious to find them and then also to do the drilling so that they wouldn't go and have the mine collapse on them. So that part, that part was dicey, too. And Felon, Davy Felon, the older guy, when he was rescued, he mouthed off. He said that the rescue team should have had them out quicker. And he became the pariah for a while because he was just mouthing off. And, you know, he, I mean, you don't bite the... the Hand that feed you. Yeah, but, he was, oh, you know, so you could tell he was a little bit yeah. stressed out. What can I say? I'm thinking about it. I'm not claustrophobic, but I'm I'm feeling the claustrophobia. Just when I'm listening to you, and I'm like, oh my god. Oh All yeah, right. yeah. And, and and I have a chapter called extrication when they pluck them out of the hole and they uh, there was this borehole. They sent down uh, parachute uh, harnesses, so they had them wrap themselves in these harnesses. They uh-huh. had axle grease helmets and so they put their hands over their uh, over their heads right. and they drug them drug them up and it was tight it was a real tight fit oh, and boy. and throw and i wrote about this in claustrophobic terms i mean like it was oh. that was one of the uh, you know one of the uh, parts of uh, of uh, the Shepton book that I was the most proud of. I wanted to make this like sort of horrific. And, um, yeah, that, 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 that would do it for me. 
And you know, yeah. the reason why I asked you about the culture, the hoodoo, is like down in Peru, they have miners, okay? And they put a figure, they call Theo, which is like the devil. It's like, you know, they, they make yeah. it like the prototypical, you know, with the horns and everything. And they put them smoking a cigar and they'll, this is usually at the entrance or into the interior dark of the mine and with uh, jugs of alcohol. And, you know, a lot of Peruvians, they're, they're ca Catholic or Christian or whatever. So everybody asks. Yeah. And for them, they say that when you're going into the bowels of the earth to mine, the only the only one that would know how to, it's almost like one of those things where you, you, you ask for help, but you fear it at the same time. The only one that's going to help you is the devil. And it's a really oh, well. <laughs> weird logic as to why they choose that versus, you know, something religious. Uh, and they, they even get to the point where they even sacrifice llamas. You know, I think it's like once a year. And then they have those that, that, that figure that they kind of make. Some of them are life size almost. And mm -hmm. th that's their justification. If you're going to be in the bowels in a mine... This this is who you're going to ask for, like, to get you out of a predicament. And I was like, OK, uh, why not? Yeah, you know? that's 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 bizarre. That's yes. Bizarre. Yes. It's you it's know, it's very weird as far as that, you know, sometimes beliefs take this like little like left turn kind of like on the belief thing. Like if you're like trapped in, in a trapped in a mine, who are you going to ask for help? <laughs> but well, uh, um. Uh, you know the the Mexicans they go to the on Day of the Dead they go and they yes. bring their departed ones like their favorite cigars or their yes. alcohol or their tacos or whatever. I mean they believe this is a day when the dead can communicate. You know when the living right. can communicate with the dead. So that's a real rich tradition in history. Right, because there's there's and, the uh, the Day of the Innocents and then there's which really goes back to you know the 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 Catholic you know, All Hallows or Samhain or Halloween, whatever you want to call it, then November 1st and November 2nd. November 1st was the Day of the Martyrs, and November 2nd was basically that you prayed for the souls in purgatory. And, you know, that kind of, you know, how it kind of like goes into something different. And in some yeah. cases, especially with the Day of the Dead, that like you said, that they go and they decorate the the tombs or the remembrance, or they even bring the, what you call it, even portraits, everything. And the yeah, Day of the I Innocence know. is it's, for it's, children. But there's an it's, aspect it's like, also where there's a fear, like especially um, if you want to look at it as like a kind of a version of ancestor worship, where uh, besides, let's say, the tomb of your family, you also put stuff out for spirits that don't have any family or anyone to pray for them or give them offerings, because those are the ones that can make trouble for you. So sometimes oh, okay. there's another, there's a, yeah, yeah, it's besides remembrance of the family. And I'm not Mexican, by the way. I'm Hispanic, but I'm not Mexican. But part of it is that, which kind of is part of the purgatory, the souls in purgatory thing of the souls that are out there that need somebody to remember and pray for them. And, you know, that, that thing that you always mm -hmm. think your family is going to look out for you even at, after you die kind of deal. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's just such, yeah, that's just an amazing thing. Um, I had a chance to uh, meet Ed and Lorraine Warren. You know, oh they my were God! The, uh, Lucky you. Yeah, yeah the Rome, <laughs> Roman Catholic uh, demonologist from Connecticut. Yes. And this was in 1988. And this is, and again, I'm like mouthing off about my book, Coal Region Hoodoo, but it's in there. I have actual pictures that I took of Ed and Lorraine. And but here's what happened in 1988. They came to Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, which is this lovely little touristy place. I mean, it's like a fairy tale place uh, with all kinds of mansions and railroads and everything. But they were on a 15-city book tour. Uh, back home, there was a thing called the Schmurl Haunting. Oh, yes. I've heard of was, that. Yeah, it, yeah, and it was our version of, the, of uh, Amityville Horror. Mm -hmm. uh, they heard grunting sounds. There were smells. They, there was profanity etched into the, uh, the mirrors. And Jack Schmurl claimed that he was raped by a female demon, a succubus. Yeah, but weren't they, and, and what's they, really funny is, weren't they a very religious family? Oh, they were, yeah, they were Roman Catholic. So yeah. the Catholic Church starts sending in all these priests 
to sit there to do an exorcism and nothing's working, nothing's working. So Ed and Lorraine Warren came there and Ed and Lorraine co-wrote the book, The, the, the Haunted, which mm-hmm. was uh, one of the family's ordeal. So they were, let's see, Jack and Janet Schmurl, Ed and Lorraine Warren and um, uh, Robert Curran. Curran. Uh, he was a reporter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the six of yeah, the five of them co-wrote that book. But anyway, um, so so Anna and Lorraine Warren were in Jim Thorpe. I had a chance to hang out with them, take pictures, and I was and I kept in touch with them over the years. And I would call them up and ask them questions about the Shmuro haunting and yes. demonology. And Ed told me that he would go and do battle with these demons, and he would go in the name of Saint Michael the Archangel. I command thee to show thyself. And then Ed Warren would go and invoke the spirit of Jesus Christ, of, uh, G- of uh, St. Michael the Archangel, and Padre Peel. Yes. And he would go and try to use the holy water and the crucifix. Uh, the, uh, the, a couple things. Um, uh, there's a uh, Russian Orthodox priest that's an exorcist uh, real close to where I live. And he was saying that the power of Satan is great. But, uh, but the power of, of the Lord is even greater. And another one with Padre Peel, there's a place in uh, Barto, B-A-R-T-O, Pennsylvania. It's outside of Allentown, Pennsylvania. And Padre Peel has this museum, church, monastery. It's just like really elaborate. It's just mm-hmm. great. But there was a, there was a, you couldn't take pictures, but there was a quote from him. And he said, even though the power of Satan is uh, horrific, he goes, I go to the Blessed Mother yes. for my strength. And Do I you said, know I like to voice, and I, my one, um, you know, I'm a former practicing Catholic, but I went to my neighbor who's a very devout Catholic. I said, well, why the Blessed Mother? Why not Jesus or God the Father? And she said, because Mary's uh, the gatekeeper. You know, so, you know, I know that a lot of, uh, a lot of Protestants don't buy into that, but I mean, you know, I mean, you know, there's there's many roads and there's, you know, I mean, it's a holy trinity and I think Mary's there too. But I mean, I couldn't believe when I read that quote from Padre Peel, you know, that uh, to to uh, ascribe such love and devotion and power, you know, our authority to, yes. to, to the Blessed Mother. So, you know, just uh, oh well, I'm, amazing. I'm, I'm, you can't see it, but I've got this huge. Uh, there's a, I've got a huge picture right over me of uh, the the Virgin's face from a Botticelli a painting uh, called the Magnificat. Yeah. It's I mean it's a much larger okay. painting, but all I have is just her face. So and um, yeah, and when I went to school in high school, I was taught by the Marian sisters and the Marist brothers. So I had a good dose of the power of the Virgin Mary kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I got a picture of Pad- Padre Pio that's framed. That's right here in my. I'm, I'm I'm in my uh, my office space right now. There he is. But uh, yeah, he, uh-huh. Padre Pio for the people that uh, for your listeners aren't familiar. Padre Pio he was uh, he was sainted, um, yes. and he suffered from stigmata, mm-hmm. and he bled like like the like the wounds of Christ. So what they did, the priest and the brothers, they wrapped his wounds with gauze, and they watched him for like maybe six or seven days, and then they took the, that gauze off, and they were looking for signs of scarring, signs that a human, human you know, yes. uh, that he was recovering from these wounds, and they were still fresh, and he was still bleeding. I mean, he bled, uh, he had the, the stigmata all of his life. So, right. so exactly. that was one thing with Padre Pio. But another thing, too, and when we talk about Bigfoot, and this is, this is about Padre Pio, but with Bigfoot, they use a term called bilocation, yes. where the reason that you can't, can't, See Bigfoot is because he, he's in front of you and then he's behind you. Mm-hmm. It's almost like two places at one time. But with Padre Peel, listen to this. Padre Peel had his own version of bilocation. He was at an opera and he was with a whole bunch of other people, an entourage of brothers and priests, and he had his head back and it was like sleeping or in a trance. But they saw him, that he was there physically. At the same time, Padre Peel was at another event with seen by priests and brothers, and he's walking and talking in two places at the same time. I mean, call that what you will, but I mean, that's exactly. like myst- mystical. That's, I mean, it's the supernatural. It's something that exactly. science can, can explain. So uh, I, I, if any of your listeners are into any, you know, with Coleridge and Hoodoo, I try to go and take the spiritual 
and the paranormal and bring it a little bit closer to uh, the to the to the scientific. And yes. in Coleridge and Hudu, I have uh, chapters on Pope John the Twenty Third, on Saint Teresa of Avila, who was the fourteenth century Spanish Spanish mystic, and man yes. is she a beautiful human being. God, I love uh, Sister Teresa, and uh, well, and, no, and, and, and it's really about... funny because, if, you know, thankfully they looked at her, her visions as something related to God, because in another place of time, it could have been the other way around. You know that, right? As far as... What, the, you know, oh, that they, they would have thought that she was possessed by the devil? Yes, and yes. Under us as yeah. Yes. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. And yeah. they had a couple of she, nuns that had uh, stuff like that. And they, 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 never, of course, nothing like like the St. Teresa of Avila, but that they, it was, it, it, they had very, how can I say, unusual visions that, that you think, you know, of course this happened hundreds of years ago that you're like, is, was this really mystical or was this a person with some type of mental illness, you know? So it's like, yeah. Yeah. Well, even, even with uh, exorcists, you know, the priest will go and determine whether or not the person is either mentally ill, like yes. schizophrenia or Tourette, mm -hmm. or if they're actually possessed by, by a demon. And yes. that's uh, a very, I mean, that's what they have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of the Schmerl haunting, they brought in this guy, Father Trebol, from New York State, and he did, I think it was three exorcisms before he finally was able to go and cleanse the house. Let me, did they ever times. explain what the origin was of how they got this going on with them? I mean... It, yeah, Lorraine Warren said that there were a number of spirits, and a couple of them were just malevolent, and they were very, very evil. Okay. And... Uh, I think there was an old woman, and I, I forget. I, and it's, it's in my uh, my uh, Coleridge and Hoodoo book, but, uh, but but I forget exactly what they what they said. But the other thing, kind of, to say with uh, Pope John the Twenty Third was canonized in 2014, mm -hmm. and Pope Pope Francis had a dual uh, ceremony. So there were two guys that were canonized. The other one was Pope John Paul the Second. And for your listeners out there, his claim the same was that he organized a school for exorcism. Uh, it was a school for exorcism to teach priests the medieval art of yes, the uh, Latin performing. Uh, ex yeah, right. And because he, he felt that evil exists, the devil exists, mm -hmm. and we need to go back there to go give ourselves this kind of protection. So he, there were priests from, I think, 132 different countries that were attending this and, and learning. So that was pretty amazing. But... I do a thing called Roman Catholic mysticism, mm -hmm. and uh, and I talk about all the things I've just been talking about. But I've been invited to go and be the guest speaker for the uh, Knights of Columbus. Okay. And they're going to have a whole bunch of knights there, and uh, so um, you know, my book was the book of the month for this Catholic uh, group back home. Really. And uh, and yeah, yeah, and they had two priests there. So as I'm talking about uh, exorcists and all this, the one priest, I mean, they sort of vetted me. You know, he, he uh, agreed with everything I said, but he said that his his, his diocese has an exorcist, but mm -hmm. he can't let me know who it is. You know, right, yes, I know that some of them, they, they, they keep their their identity, like, you know, their secret identity as the exorcist. Yeah, because I think if, if you knew that I was an exorcist, I think a whole lot, of, if people oh, knew that I God. was, when I'm not, they would just start coming to me for whatever, you know, so. Right, right, yeah. no, and... and and I hate to say it, there's there's a lot of people that are mentally ill that think that they're possessed, but you know the the uh, the you know they'll they'll tell you you know if your problem is a mental illness, you can't levitate, you can't speak languages you don't know, you don't know have knowledge of things that supposedly people that are possessed would know. But besides the fact they always have a psychiatrist, you know, look at these people just to make sure before they ever go forward with an exorcism. And, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, what was it? The, um, it, it, yeah, there's, I could see where that would be a problem if you knew that the, the, <laughs> the priest that you had at your parish was the, the exorcist for the diocese. It'd be like, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, St. Teresa of Avila, it's, it's documentation, you know, numerous do document cases where she actually levitated, yes. where the nuns had to hold, hold her down. And St. Teresa of Avila, and this is connect, connected with the Shepton thing, she said that through prayer and meditation, 
we could reach states of ecstasy and rapture and flight of the soul. And flight of the soul is an out-of-body experience that was, ex- that was experienced by felon and throne numerous times. They went out of the pit and they looked down and they could see the rescue team and all the other stuff. I mean, they were all oh, there did. looking down. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah, they did. Two different occasions, yeah. So, wow. Let me tell yeah. Were they in, well, no, of course they were, Marlene. I'm thinking, did they have any light down there where they were at or were they in pitch darkness? Do you know? No, it's, it's, they had like uh, the, the uh, lights that they had. Okay. It eventually, eventually went out oh, uh, and it was just pitch black. They're crawling around on their hands and knees like dogs. They're getting cut up. They're sucking in coal particles and dust. I mean, it was horrible. And the worst thing was, and down there, 330 uh, feet down there, it was like a constant, like maybe 54 degrees, you know. So they, I mean, you know, and and there's there's water, there's um, uh, sulfur water that was there. There was nothing to eat. I mean, you know, uh, I don't believe the uh, the stories of cannibalism. I think that when the mine collapsed, mm-hmm. that felon and throne were on one side, and the other guy, this Louis Bova, was on the other side. He was, and I believe that they were separated by right. a mountain of coal right. and rock. So I don't believe that. Even though people come up to me when I do these presentations you know, right. in, in northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, people always have a theory about what happened. They always had a theory, and. Uh, well, so. you know, you always think, of, well, you know, when you're hungry, you're hungry. And, you know, you, you know, he, you hear about these trips of these back in the, the 19th century that went up to the to the Arctic, you know, that they were trying to find a passage over. And some of these ships, they resorted to cannibalism. And but it was it was it took a long time before they got there, you know. Um, yeah. And were they giving them food or were they spending these whole two weeks without any food? No, what happened, uh, they were down there for two weeks uh, entombed. Okay. But after, after the sixth day, they drilled down. They were able to find them. Okay. And then they started, to, they started to make that hole a little bit bigger, and they were able to send them down things like salve and medication for the hands because they were all cut up. Okay. Um, you know, food, soup, all that stuff. Um, but the thing of it is, I mean, they're, the hardest thing, well, while they're down there, they saw Pope John the Twenty Third. He was there for two weeks. Standing there in the corner. And that's why I'm asking pole. you that thing about the light. I was like, did this apparition have its own luminescence? You know, that's that's what I'm thinking about, you know, or were they here in pitch dark and all of a sudden they see yeah, this they, figure? He, he must have somehow lit up. There must have been some kind of, uh, uh-huh. you know, he might have been uh, emitting some kind of light, but they saw, they saw stairwells, uh, gold, you know, leading to heaven. They saw, and, and they saw ancestors family and ancestors and, really um yeah and even though you know there were people there that they believed were their ancestors but they they've never saw them before but here's the thing i knew this guy this business person he's like an accountant and he was the uh the person that worked with davy felon and uh he off he uh, he let me interview him but i couldn't use his name he was going to stay anonymous but he asked davy felon he goes well davy what about this cannibalism. And Davy said, no, that's not true. That never happened. And what about these stories? He goes, yeah, I saw my family, my ancestors, they're sitting on all those steps and they saw doors going into the sides. You know, just a uh, lot of really bizarre things. I mean, just um, Let me you tell know, you amazing. And, and Davy Felon, who was very, very straightforward, uh, he said that, um, you know, there's a lot, and he never went looking for a publicity. I mean, the paparazzi just kept on asking them. And, and then what happened was, before they went up there, Davy Felon told Throne, the younger guy, "Keep your mouth shut. Don't tell them what we saw down here. Down here, they'll think, they'll think we're crazy." And as soon as Throne went up there, very impetuous, you know, they had the paparazzi. And they're saying, "Well, what was it like down there? And how did you did you think you'd never, ever get out? And what kept you going? And you know, all this other stuff." And all of a sudden, Throne started to talk and tell about seeing, you know, the stranger that was Pope John the 23rd and the stairways, you know, then leading did to heaven. Did Pope John so, ever say or, I don't know, say or telepathically communicate with them in some way? No, but here's the thing. When you talk about the MO, the modus operandi, in all three cases of his 
uh, purported, his alleged miracles. Mm -hmm. The other two were medical miracles, and what happened was uh, the nun, and there was another person that uh, he stood in the corner with his arms folded, and he gave them a sign of peace, gave them a sign uh, with the the Shepton miners that they were going to be rescued, but gave these other people a sign that they were going to get better, they were going to be get well. Uh, the one okay. nun had, had horrible uh, stomach um, uh, uh, condition, and the doctors, when they checked her out, she was completely cured, and they called it a medical miracle. There was no other way to explain, you know, this, this, you know, this horrible, uh, you know, damaged flesh that she had, you know, prior to the, to the miracle. So they called it a medical miracle. And um, uh, one incredible. thing about Pope John the Twenty Third that people don't know: uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, he was the one. Pope John the Twenty Third always said that we should have uh, an audience with uh, the Marxists, mm-hmm. the communists. You know, have an open dialogue. And during the Cuban Missile Crisis of '62, he was able to talk to President Kennedy, who was a Catholic, mm-hmm. by Del Castro and Khrushchev. And he did some things behind the scenes to get that uh, the temperature to lower the temperature. Yes. And eventually, eventually the Soviets uh, took their missiles out of there and never put them there. And I don't know what the trade-off was. I don't know exactly what uh, they gave Khrushchev to save face, but I'm sure that there was some kind of a right. Yeah, there's always some Pope... type of face saving involved and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so Pope John the Twenty Third that was involved in that and uh, just amazing guy. And uh, he was the one that brought in Vatican II, which liberalized the church. And people either viewed him as a, as a saint for doing that and right. being progressive, or, or as the devil himself for, for, for doing this. You know, there's right. still Catholic priests and churches that refuse to go along with Vatican II. Right. Now, I, I remember with my school, the nuns, when I started, they had the full... Um, the full habit. They were dressed in white because down in Florida and South Florida, it was hot. But they were, you know, where you, the only thing they had was their face was out. And I remember like a few years later, you know, I was still in grade school. Then they allowed them to wear like, like uh, the habit was to the knees and, you know, they didn't have the, the whole big giant uh, habit, you know, at the top. It was, and that was because of that change of what you're talking about that they. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, remember Pope that. Pope John Twenty Third and Vatican II. Yeah, he re- wanted to reform uh, the church. I, I wanted to say this. I don't know how much time we have. But, no, go uh, ahead. If for, for some of your listeners on the golf side of Florida, uh, I'm going to be at the uh, Crystal River Library on Tuesday, March the 26th. Okay. It'll be from one to three, and that's uh, uh, in Crystal River, Florida, the library. And I'm going to be talking about uh, flying saucer esoteric. Uh, yes. The Altered States of UFOlogy. So I'm doing a uh, presentation, and uh, we've been contacting a number of uh, paranormal groups in the area, especially Ocala. So we think we're going to have a nice representation yes. there. And uh, so, you know, I'm hoping that uh, some of your uh, listeners may be able to go and attend and, uh, you know, and just say hello. I'd love to go. And, yes, uh, absolutely. You know, talk absolutely. To them. If anything, um... Max, for you, for my the podcast listeners, what's because I'll have a, a link to your website and the credits of the show. But what is your website address? Yeah, it's www.maximfurek.com. Okay. So www.maximfurek.com. So you post all and these events that you're going to be attending on your website, right? I'm going to be posting that one. Yes, okay. I'll, I'll do that tonight. Because. I, you know, sometimes people, you know, when they're listening, they they can't, you know, they're driving or doing something else. So this is a way always that they could go and, and get the information that they need. And I used to have yeah, family yeah. in Crystal River till very recently. They moved out in the 70s and then some of them just died and others just moved away. And as a matter of fact, we sold a big property we had out there like last year or a couple of oh, years so ago. Oh, so you were from Crystal River. Well, I wasn't. I had family that moved out there from Miami in the 70s. And this was, yeah. it was really funny because there was a joke. It was like Crystal River, you know, there was like one stop sign. I mean, one, one traffic light. And if you blew past that, yeah, that was Crystal River back there. And uh, um, yeah. yeah, we had a, a, a great, well, he was my, wait, my grand uncle. 
he lived to be 105 years old, but his birthday happened to always fall very close to Labor Day. So the whole family would go out there every year thinking, this is going to be the year, you know, we better go and see him. And he lived to be Ooh. 105. So I, that's why, yeah. you know, we're very, you know, we had family out there, but everybody had some good genetics, some good genetics. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's really funny because every year they would send out a newspaper reporter to ask him, you know, he, what's your secret for your long life? And all he would tell him is, yeah. I eat three square meals a day. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. So much for the secret to longevity. But mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, that kind of I deal. Don't, I, I don't, yeah. They talk about these blue zones. You know, that's where people live to be over 100. And there's like mm-hmm. all these blue zones in the world. Uh, there's one in uh, Costa Rica. There's one off the coast of Ca- California. There's one in, I think, uh, Italy, Japan. And a friend of mine from the coal region. Now, you would not expect the coal region, the gritty, dirty, yes. you know, coal mining thing to be a blue zone. But she's talking about her relatives that live to be over 100. And she's writing this book about that and the, and, and the blue zone in the coal region. And that just blew my mind. I mean, I, but all the variables that allow people to live long, you have a group of people to surround you, you know, that care yes, about you. Yes. You, ha- you, ha- you, you uh, eat relatively clean. You maybe walk and exercise a lot. You're not, you're not sedentary. So it's all the stuff that maybe we did back in the... I, don't well, know, I heard that, and I want to say that this town, again, I might be just making up, I, th- I want to say it was Pennsylvania or in that area, same thing. They did a study where there was a, a doctor that he said that, you know, when people got older, they didn't have all the, you know, he says, all my, once I had a, you know, I guess when people, it was a smaller town, you know, when you know all your patients and the families and that kind of deal. And he found uh-huh. that if they developed any type of heart problems or anything like that, it was way later in old age and same thing, longevity, good health. And they were looking at what is, you know, these people, you know, they weren't all related. What was it? And believe it or not, they found that they had a bunch of civic activities in the town. <laughs> And that thing where people were actually like what you said, that they were like milling around and interacting and they had friends and they had things to do, that that promoted part of the longevity because throughout the life, your life, basically for the people that stayed there, you know, there wasn't this thing where, you, you know, you stayed at home as you grew older and people forgot about you. There was there was a bunch of civic, you know, groups. Yeah. The, the, the most precious the most valuable thing that humans have or can have is connection to other people and when you are and we talked about this tonight but when you're mentally ill or addicted or filled with shame caused by uh, childhood trauma or whatever you know you lose that you don't feel that you're worthy of that human connection and that's what shame and trauma does and all the other things so the fact that these people are connected and they feel that they're contributing to a group, yes. you know, that's a wonderful thing. I mean, you know, it's just, I mean, you know, getting out of our egocentric self yeah. and, and, and connecting with a, with a greater good with, you know, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's like, you know, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, it, that's, let's face it. If it's, spiritual. if you're going to sit home and, and I, I know I'm going to, you know, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Even if you do have reason to feel sorry for yourself, it's better to go out there and do something, you know, so that you don't sit there mm-hmm. and ponder why the universe is picking on you kind of deal so yeah i know yeah um you know you, you, you i don't know i <clears throat> some people sometimes they fall into that rut and then they do like you said they isolate and you know they don't go out and, and i hate to say it but the, the 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 phones the cellular phones and sometimes the computers and everything people sometimes tend to like let go of the person to person face to face kind of activity and that's like, don't do that. No, 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 don't do that. <laughs> well, they're saying that a lot of young people, you know, I mean, they're connected with the technology. They're, they're techies, you know, but, yeah. they're, they're, but they're not connected one on one, you know, face to face. No, I mean, in, in, per- in person. So, you know, it's almost like a trade off. But, you know, I remember back in the day when, you know, it was almost like church. We would listen to these albums, you know, I mean, record albums, vinyl, mm-hmm. and yes. you'd play one side. And then you'd flip it over and play the other side. It was like a ritual, and the music the, was was the sacrament. And uh, yeah, you know, so uh, right, right. That that, just... I, I, I tell I tell people, you know, once it was a, 
the really good albums were the ones that had a lot of good songs, but sometimes you had a couple of good songs and the rest of the songs on the album were like, uh, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And I, like... I, remember, I remember the one the one guy was really progressive. He had a party and he played Dark Side of the Moon, you know, Pink Floyd's, I mean, for, and we all listened to that collectively mm -hmm. for the first time. And that was a wonderful experience because, I mean, it wasn't just me and the music, but it was me and a room full of other people you know, focused on the same thing, the same vibration. And let's face it, I mean, Dark Side of the Moon was just, I, I think it's still on the list of, you know, the top right. selling albums of all time. I mean, it's been around for decades. So, but I mean, that was just so different. And, if, and whatever the Beatles did, you know, the, uh, and to make music an art form, uh, Pink Floyd took it a little bit further or a lot further. Oh, let me tell you something. I went to see Ringo Starr and his all star band. Uh, uh, yeah, got, okay. last summer and you know he brought in some great people he brought some yeah. great people in have? to play with him he's what a great concert it was an open air yeah. arena it was fantastic yeah. and yeah so yeah, yeah. Some of those I, I thought when I saw him back home he had uh, Todd Rundgren who stole the show yeah. Todd Rundgren is this little little piss spot that jumps up and down and kicks his leg but he's so good and they had people from Santana the mm -hmm. guy from Mr. Mister Total. Wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really yeah. yeah Rito does a good job, but then he does all the rockabilly stuff, you know. That he, yeah, yeah. You know, so. But yeah, they, they, he yeah, brings he, in some interesting people. He brings in some really good musicians sometimes, and they yeah. like. I but I know what you're talking about as far as stealing the show. Yeah, yeah. But still, it's yeah. like it's great. It was a very good concert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's and some. Yeah. Go yeah, ahead. I, yeah, yeah. No, so um, yeah, I used to be a rock journalist and. Um, you know, one of my bigger things was I interviewed Hall and & Oates, and I had to get uh, Oh, my God, I right. love Hall and & yeah. Oates, and I know everybody must be going yeah. Marlene, but I love Hall and & Oates. <laughs> yeah. No, they're good. Uh, uh, I had to write a letter to Tommy Matola, and he was married to Mariah Carey at yes. the time, but they were the power couple, and so Tommy Matola Productions, they were like, the, I guess, the publicists for Hall & Oates. So I got permission. So I interviewed them in Boulder, Colorado, mm -hmm. in a room reserved for just in case so that was kind of cool and that was one th and then i met these people that had a publication there so i was writing for them uh and then the other one was we went to estes park where stephen king wrote the shining, yes, the shining. and estes park estes park has the stanley hotel and uh, -huh. uh stephen king called it the overlook but stanley hotel according to the historian i wrote, wrote an article about this but he claimed that it was haunted by the ghost of Cora Stanley, and she was blind, and you could hear her tap, tap, tapping down the steps. So that was Cora. So, uh, but that was uh, that was. Let me tell you something. The, the, they benefited from that Stephen, Stephen, a Stephen King uh, novel making that you know because there's still people going out there the tourism because it's the Shining Hotel, you know everybody thinks of it. Yep, yep, and they're ripping off all the brass room uh, numbers really that was the big thing. oh my god that's <laughs> yeah yep yep uh, they weren't their, their souvenirs yeah but, yeah, but I... boulder was boulder was pretty boulder was really good for my career and uh you know but... nice time it's almost like an in-between between uh la and uh and new york you know just pretty hip so yeah but yeah there's like definitely and it's you know, the, there's a lot of groups and or performers that they had their heyday and not, not because they died and they just faded away. And then there's others that have kept going and going and going. And 40 years later, 30 years later, they're still around. And, yeah. uh, and with Hollow Notes, they tried to go and jazz up their act. So they were touring with Tears for Fears, mm -hmm. you know, get a younger generation. Right. And Daryl Hall was always pissed off that he wasn't getting the uh, the recognition what's the, the, the no the respect the respect that he felt he deserved because because you know his his crime was that he had all these commercial hits all these top 10 hits right. well so what i mean that's what he is he's a gifted songwriter and musician right and he's successful so some of the people the boo birds you know the um uh, elitist you know, avant-garde, you know, musicologists and that, you know, the rock aficionados, they sort of look down on Hall of Notes. But, I mean, they're, they're good. I've seen them in concert, like, maybe five times. And, I, I, I know, saw them, like, what, three years ago, and I'm waiting for them to come back. The ones I was kind yeah. of like, and I know this has nothing to do with the paranormal, but I'm still going to talk about it. I went to see the Doobie Brothers, like, their 50-year oh, yeah, okay. 
And I was very disappointed, yeah. and I'm going to tell you why. They have so many great songs, and they paid like three of them, and then they were playing these some of this unknown music, and I was like, what? You know, you guys have such uh, great songs. Why are you doing that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the best one was Foreigner, and Lou Graham, the lead singer, is no longer with him because they kicked him out because of his drug use. Uh -huh. But whoever the new lead singer is, I mean, he's note for note perfect. But anyway, right. they're playing their perfect night, perfect audience. It was an outdoor thing, and hit after hit after hit after hit. I mean, Foreigner must have like 15 top, top 20 yes. hits. I mean, yeah, just I'm going to be going to see going them. Going through going one after the other. And then, of course, when they do, I want to know what love is. They yes. bring in the local choir to, to sing that. They, they always do that. So that's yeah. their sort of like their trademark. But, yeah, they, they were good. No, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna, uh, we went to see Men at Work. It was funny, one of those things. Okay. Uh, the only guy <laughs> that's left from Men at Work is the original singer. Everybody else okay. is young and, you know, that kind of thing. And, of course, his voice is... You know, you hear it and you know it's him. And it was like, yeah, if it wasn't for you, forget it. But he's, you know, when they get to the part when they're introducing the band members, <laughs> and it's like, that. You mean you're the only? You're the only. It's not men at work. It's man at work. So yeah. <laughs> so good, yeah. some of these. So anyway, guys, I'm gonna be back with you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll, because I'll sign back on in a minute, Max, to speak to some of my audience. But I'm gonna stop this recording so you and me can talk. Okay, Hold I'm on. back. I was talking. Okay, I might be. I might be. I was talking to Max about maybe, maybe this is a big maybe, maybe putting in some type of paranormal conference later on over here down here in Florida. So I'll keep you guys posted if that happens. You know what? Because you know one thing is tentative talking, and then you know another thing is to produce it. But yes, I think that would be super interesting, and you know. Uh, by the way, if, if you're a researcher, paranormal researcher, ufologist, Bigfoot or anything, and then this is like hot, I mean hot off the press. If you think you might be interested in participating probably in that conference if we get it together for the end of the year of this year, contact me, Marlene at MiamiGhostChronicles.com and, you know, just you'll say I, I might be available or I might be interested. Like I said, it's not a definite thing, something that's talk about just in the planning stages, but... Uh, it would be good to to maybe line up people that would be, you know, would like to do a presentation. Uh, because, hey, at the end of the day, and, and, you know, and I've said it before, I mean, you could look at all these paranormal shows. And the truth is that, how's this? Partly they're produced for entertainment purposes. They have to squeeze, you know, this information or the, whatever they're presenting X amount of time. Plus, they have to grab the the audience's attention and keep it. I'm not saying let's have a boring conference, but if you really want to get to skinny, the real, what really goes on, whether it's paranormal, ghost hunting, UFOs, uh, you know, Bigfoot, whatever, cryptid, you know, the, the ordinary people as normies that are out there doing this work or have been doing this work, this is really when you hear the good stories, the stories that you're not going to hear in any of the shows. Because after a while, I'm, I'm sure some people have noticed some of these shows, all of a sudden it's the repetition or some version of that certain location or this certain story of the, what happened there. And after a while, it's like, okay. But the really good, interesting stories is from people that are out in the field um, working on stuff like this. You know, whatever it is, whether, uh, you know, you get some people, like I said, that have been doing it for years. So they they have a whole host of stories. In some cases, they even been tracking, you know, how often does this phenomena occur? Um, does it coincide with something else? Is Does weather play, a, a, you know, have anything to do with it? Is it a certain time of year? Is it more prevalent around this type of men, women, or children? Yeah. Anyway, the people out there that have been doing it for a while, the best stories I've said, you know, even historical places, the best stories come from docents or that have been there for a few years. Those are the ones that will tell you because they've been there early before anybody arrives or afterwards. They got the best stories and they'll tell you, yeah, I've seen and I've heard and or I make sure that when we close down, I'm not the last one out the door. I'm, or I'm never left here alone 
Why? Because at some point they had some experience, you know, when like nobody else should be here and they hear stuff or see stuff. Or in some cases, it's really funny because this happens a lot. The people that are regularly at these locations, they get their name called. Like whatever's there is intelligent enough to know their name. And that wigs them up. That is like, I'm out of here. Bye. They just grab their stuff and... And they'll say, yeah, they'll come back and they'll say, I wasn't scared, but let's face it. It's a little bit disquieting to have your name called by thin air, for lack of a better word. So anyway, I, like I said, I'll keep you guys posted. And uh, of course, there'll be a link to Max's website on the credits of the show. And like he said, he, March, he's going to have that presentation at the Crystal River Library. All right. And this is going to be March the 26th, I believe, at 2 p.m. But for verification purposes, go ahead and go to his website and check it out. Uh, as far as, you know, he's he's got interesting books. Let me tell you something. He's, he's, got, he's got an interesting life. You know, here you go from rock and roll, you know, interviewing rock and roll people and somewhere in the mix, people with addiction problems. And then we're going here into the paranormal. I, I, I find that extremely interesting. And I really hope you like the show. And thank you for coming back every week and spending this time with me. And again, I want to repeat MiamiGhostChronicles.com. If you want to, or MP Pellister, I've got links. Uh, if you want to listen to the podcast versions without commercial interruptions, I've got a list of all the shows there. That all you have to do is click and you can listen from the browser or just download the mp3 file. And so sign up for my Substack articles at uh, mppellister.com. Like I said, I've got articles, old shows, new podcasts, interesting stuff, etc., etc., etc. So, till next time, take care. <laughs>